Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and good afternoon to all participants. Thank you for joining our sixth webinar of international webinar series, Clinical Best Practices in Physiotherapy Management. I'm Muhammad Alif, will be your moderator for today's session. Before I, I hand over the platform to our honorable speaker, on behalf of the organizing committee, I would like to remind all participants first to mute your microphone and to switch off your camera throughout the session. This is to ensure the technical stability of the platform. Secondly, if you have any question, please post it in the chat box. The OC will attend to it and I will read your questions at the end of each session. Thirdly, please switch on your camera for photo at the end of the session. And finally, the attendance link will be posted in the chat box at 4.30 p.m. and will be available until 6 p.m. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker, bring to you live from the land of rising sun. Professor Goh Ah Cheng was born in Singapore. He graduated as a physical therapist from Auckland Institute of Technology, Auckland, New Zealand. He then obtained his master's from Sydney University and PhD from Curtin University, Perth, Australia. He worked as a chief physiotherapist in the Singapore Armed Forces before coming to Japan in 1996. After working at Shinsu Medi University Medical Technology Junior College, he has been appointed in the Department of Health Sciences since 2001. He was appointed as a Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences, Irio Sose University since 2018. <laughs> Professor Goh is currently the President of the International Society of Physical Therapy since 2019. So please welcome Professor Goh, the platform is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just see. Can you hear me? Am I on mute? Yes, we can hear you, Prof. Okay, good. Okay, good. Um, first of all, uh, thanks for the invitation and uh, congratulations to Prof uh, Haiza for your the birth of your your child. I saw it on Facebook. Very cute. I'm sure all of you would rather look at. Uh, the photos of his newborn child and uh, look at me for the next 35 minutes, but please bear with me. But congratulations, really, really, really wonderful news. Uh, secondly, is the, I'm, I'm the president of the uh, International Society for Electrophysical Agents, not physical therapy. <laughs> I'm not that level yet. I'm just looking at the electrophysical agents. So I've changed, I've changed the topic a little bit. I was supposed to talk about TENS but I've changed it to pain management in musculoskeletal conditions to make it a bit more in line with what you people were doing. It's not, when you talk about pain management, we're not really just talking about um, um, tense. And I don't want to, all of you to have this image that, you know, uh, um, tense will be the only thing that you can use for pain management. But I will be uh, uh, focusing on tense, but just to let you know that, uh, uh, pain management is more than that. So there's four sections that I want to talk about. The last one, pain treatment is where I will spend most of my time going through that. But before that, I'll cover the neuroanatomy, physiology, and then pain assessment very, 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 very quickly. So mostly I'm going to be using, you know, uh, videos from the, from the internet. This is a really, really good series. This is from the University of British Columbia. It's on YouTube anyway. And I just want to play a little bit for you, not all of it, just so that you can go and download and watch it yourself if you're interested. Now, for some of you, I... By the way, can you hear the music coming up from here? Are you able to hear? Can you hear the voice from the video? Yes, I can hear the, the voice. Okay. Now, I think most of you are aware, but you can switch on the closed caption and then you can actually choose the subtitles that you want. So in this case, we are looking at uh, trying to get the auto-translate to uh, Malay. And uh, most of you are, I'm sure you're conversant, you're bilingual anyway. But if your students are interested, you know, they can just, uh, you know, have a look at some of this video and the uh, subtitles will do quite a bit of uh, uh, simple explanation in the native language. Uh, I'm going to fast forward this actually. You can see from here, you know, they, 
it's a, it's a very good review of anatomy, neuroanatomy. And, and the reason why I'm going to this is you'll find out later because I'm going to be using terminologies that will refer to some of these uh, uh, neural structures in the brain. And also the central nervous system, the spinal cord itself, not just the brain, but spinal cord. The peripheral nerves are less complicated. But so again, there's a video here, but I'll just tell you this is available from the YouTube channel uh, at UBC. Just Google it and you'll be able to find it there. So you need to understand the neuroanatomy. The neurophysiology, on the other hand, I will spend a bit more time uh, on this, about five, 10 minutes on this. And, and basically we're looking at how the signal goes from the periphery, which is the skin and the sensory nerves, and then how it reaches the brain and how you perceive that pain, because that has, that has a lot to do with how you use tense as well. If you can't understand this, then tense becomes something that you, you have problems uh, managing. So we'll talk a little bit about this. So we know that it travels from the periphery to the nervous system, but along the way, the, sig the signal can be modified, it can be inhibited, it can be you know, amplified and so on. And when we do treatment, we are trying to inhibit the signal from reaching the brain. Uh, uh, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but even so, we can still change perception the perception of pain as well. I'll come to that later when we talk about treatment. So uh, we know that from the skin to the brain, there's lots of things happening in between. Uh, just bear in mind, we'll come to that again later. This is a, again from the same YouTube channel looking at new, uh, neurophysiology of pain. Again, I'm not going to play the whole video, but I would I would refer you to this uh, YouTube channel uh, uh, UBC channel, go and have a look at it. It's really, really good. Uh, it's good for students as well. But for some of you, it may just be a, a reminder, a review. What I want to talk about is this uh, A, B, and C. Specificity theory, pattern theory, and the current theory. Very quickly, specificity theory just means that this is the original, original theory of pain. It means every, every um, uh, sensation in the skin has a has a one-to-one -one connection to the sensory uh, receptors. So Merkel corpuscle is for touch, Meissner is for vibration, Pachin is for pressure, and the free nerve endings are for pain. So if you activate the free nerve endings, you'll get the perception of pain. If you activate any of the other nerve endings, you will not get pain. Now we know that this is not really true because there is no one-to-one -one precise relationship between sensory nerve and perception many uh, uh, sensory sensation can give you the perception of pain. It's not just pain fibers, for example, something that is hot, something that is hot can give you pain, or something that's very, very bright can also give you pain. Something that's very strong pressure can also give you pain. So it's not, so this one-to-one -one specificity theory doesn't really make sense. The second one here is looking at how pain can be modulated from the brain down to the spinal cord. And this specificity theory does not explain that well enough. So we know that this theory is a bit, it's, you know, it's not, it's not, the, it's probably a good start, but that's not the real story. So the real story, well, they try to improve on that by the pattern theory. And the pattern theory says that any, any sensory uh, receptor can give you pain as long as it is the right intensity and the right the right, uh, uh, right intensity and the right, um, and the right uh, frequency. frequency. Something's wrong with my audio. Are you still okay with that? I'm getting a feedback. Can you still hear me? I can, I can still hear you. But okay. there's, uh, there is an echo. Echo to your voice. There's some echo in here. Let me just... Uh, Okay, maybe it's okay now. Can you, can you see this fire that I have in front of me? Can all of you see this fire that I have? I'm not smoking, I, I promise you, but I want to show you this fire here. Oh, my, my video just went off. <laughs> Hang on, it's getting... Can you see the fire? Are you okay with yes, that? Yes, bro. Yes, bro. Okay. You can see. Now, if I were to put my, 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 my hand, you know, above the fire, I'm just going to feel some, you know, it's a bit warm. 
But if I keep going further and further and further and further down until I'm near the flame, I will feel not just warm, but it will actually feel hot and painful. I, in fact, I'll damage myself. I think all of you know that. But watch this. I think all of you will know this. What if I just move my hand in and out of the flame? I'm moving in and out of the flame. I feel the heat, but I don't feel the pain. And that's what the pattern theory is. If it's at the right frequency, at the right intensity, you feel pain. But if it's not at the right frequency or not at the right intensity, I don't feel the pain. I just feel warm. And I think in Malaysia, you have this festival where, uh, you know, they walk on fire. Do you have it in Malaysia? Maybe in Bali, I think they walk on fire, the fire walkers. They can walk on the hot coals and they don't feel pain but they have to do it at a certain frequency. And the frequency is they have a drum, somebody beats a drum, they go into a trance, so to speak, and then they walk at that frequency and they basically walk without feeling any pain. Now, I don't recommend that you do this, but, um, but this is what pattern theory is all about. Basically, anything can give you pain, even light, visual, if it's very bright, you can start to feel pain, chemical, uh, <laughs> Malaysians probably will not uh, feel much pain, but if you eat hot chili, if you hit something that's very spicy and very hot, you feel pain under your tongue area. So, and uh, temperature, anything that's too hot, like you drink very hot coffee or you touch a hot kettle, you feel pain. So any of those can give you pain. But again, this doesn't make sense because we know that, yes, that happens, but there is a there is a one-to-one -one relationship. That means there is free nerve endings. Those free nerve endings are there. There are pain fibers. So if you are saying that anything can give you pain, not just the pain fibers, then what is the point of having pain fibers? So the current theory then combines A plus B plus recent findings. And this is where the current theory is. And I think very quickly, I'm going to go through this so that uh, when we talk about uh, TENS, we'll be able to have a, 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 a good understanding of how it works. So everybody knows at the periphery, I won't, I won't, that, uh, at the periphery, no, I won't go into this. You have this transduction occurs at the periphery. That means if anything that's hotter than 42 degrees, or colder than 10 degrees, it starts a process called, called transduction, where the sensory fibers, therefore, depolarize. And then they will transmit that signal all the way from the, sense, uh, from the skin to the spinal cord, and that's called conduction. And then from the spinal cord, it goes to the brain to certain pathways in the brain. The first one here, the lateral pathway is called the neurospinal thalamic tract. So it's transmitted all the way to the brain. And this neurospinal thalamic tract tells you how much pain you are feeling and where is the pain. Now, physios are definitely interested in this. How much pain? Always, you ask the patient, you know, how much pain do you feel from zero to 10? They'll tell you, mm, I'm five. That's how much pain. Where is the pain? They point to their shoulder. That's the pain. So those are the things that you are very interested in. But unfortunately, that's not enough for you to be able to understand pain okay, I... to trans to be able to treat it properly. So the second one here, oh sorry, it goes all the way up to the uh, uh, cerebral cortex where you then perceive the pain. This is where then you feel, ouch, I feel pain. So, so now, now, medial to this, medial to this, there's the paleospinal thalamic tract. And this one also goes all the way up to the brain. And this one has yes. got to do with more Betul. about. What the... yang buat Pete's punya assessment hari tu? Baki Sen. Uh, are we okay? Sorry. This, this one is more to do with the emotional component mm -hmm. of pain. Are we okay so far? I cannot see any of you, so I'm just going. I hope it's okay. If it's not, please stop me and I will do. And this one, again, it goes to uh, perception level. So you start to feel like, you know, this is unpleasant. This pain is really unpleasant. Of course, some people that, uh, people that are masochistic, for example, they have it, the dysfunction is there. The pain actually feels pleasant to them, but that's not something that we want to 
talk about today. But just note that this is a real thing. People can perceive it as unpleasant or they can also perceive it as pleasant. And if it's pleasant, obviously, you will not want to treat, uh, they won't come to you as a patient. That's another totally different lecture altogether. Now, the next one here, the spinal mechanical tract goes all the way up to the midbrain. And from there, this is where we have to be, uh, this, this word here, P-A-G, peri ductal gray in the midbrain. That's important. That one, you will, that one has an important role to play when we talk about modulation of pain. Uh, for, for example, manual therapy, this is where they, are, they think that this is, this is the area that uh, is being activated when you do manual therapy and that will then reduce the pain that you feel. Of course, intense, that also will happen. Now, if you're talking about uh, hot pack, for example, and uh, uh, ice pack, for example, this is not uh, this is not the target because the uh, hot pack and ice pack, the energy is not strong enough. It doesn't go all the way up to the midbrain. The energy just goes to the spinal cord, and you can probably block the, the pain at the spinal cord level for hot packs and, uh, and cold packs, for example. But if you want if you want to reach the PAG then you have to use something stronger and an energy source that's much stronger. And fortunately in uh, physio, we have that. We have um, uh, TENS, uh, electrical stimulation. And manual therapists will tell you they have mobilization techniques. So PAG is something important. We'll come back to that later. Then the last one here is the spinal reticular tract. Again, this one uh, terminates at the brain stem. So none of this will reach to the level of perception. So you don't feel the pain, but it's, but certain things are happening here where the signal can actually U-turn, U-turn and come back down to the spinal cord. And that's where one of the things that we need to target when we are looking at physical therapy treatment, whether it's mental therapy or electrotherapy. So we'll come to that soon. Now, so the medial tracts there, the B, C, and the paleospinal thalamic, spinal mechanical, spinal reticular, they are more, they have more to do with memory of pain, emotional response. All those things are things that are uh, uh, different from the, the, the lateral, lateral tract, which is where is the pain, how much is the pain. And the lateral tracts, the spinal thalamic, uh, spinal uh, thalamic tract, uh, those are the ones that physio have always been concentrating on all the time. And I think some of you starts to you start to realize that in manual therapy, they're shifting a little bit from there and going into memory or pain, emotional response as well. So they're starting to to look at that also as being important. But perhaps the 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 the, the treatment methodology is not our traditional type of uh, you you can't treat that with manual therapy or electrotherapy. You've got to do other things like cognitive behavior therapy. Uh, patient education and so on. We'll come to that later. So this other thing here, this this uh, this uh, midbrain area, just before, just below perception, that brown area there, is called the pain matrix. And the pain matrix is inter interesting in the sense that this is one of our target when we look at how we want to uh, use tens to treat pain. This is actually the. It's almost like a telephone exchange. This is where you can influence that pain before it's transmitted to the cortex. Once it's transmitted to the cortex, perception of pain will occur. But before it goes there, if you can do something at the pain matrix level, you can change the, 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 the you can actually block the sensation of pain or you can modulate that sensation of pain. So we'll come to that as well. Pain matrix. Okay, so let's come to this. Acute pain. Chronic pain. We are almost at the treatment part here, but acute pain is sorry. I didn't. I, I'm going to go back one slide. I can't go back one slide. Okay. Acute pain. You know from the earlier slide. Slide there is 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 good pain. It's actually physiological pain. It's not a disease. Acute pain or 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 um um. Uh, it's, uh, it protects you from harming yourself. It's self-preservation, so it's good pain. And but sometimes uh, it interferes with our activities of daily living, so you need to manage that pain. Um, after the immediate danger is gone, the function is no longer there, but the pain may persist. So doctors will give you 
uh, medication to reduce that or physical therapy will give you simple treatment to reduce that pain. So that's acute pain. But we should not focus on acute pain itself. We should actually look at the cause of that acute pain. So if, if the acute pain is caused by inflammation, for example, then the doctors will give you anti-inflammatory drugs. Physio will treat the inflammation with cryotherapy. If the cause of the acute pain is because of swelling, for example, then we should be treating to reduce the swelling, maybe with rice therapy, compression, elevation, ice, and so on. So the cause of the pain, acute pain, uh, should be the focus of treatment and not the acute pain itself. So although we want to understand what acute pain is, we should not uh, be too concerned that you know, don't, don't, don't focus too much on that. And uh, one reason why I say that is because students always, when they, the patient comes to them, they'll ask you, where's your pain? Or, you know, uh, immediately is where's your pain? So you're focusing them onto the, the pain itself. So the patient has this message from you to say that, oh, okay, so the physio is going to treat my pain. But actually you might be better off treating the inflammation or treating the swelling, for example. In the same way, doctors are the same thing. They, if they just give you painkillers, it's not going to help. But if you are, if the problem is inflammation, they give you anti-inflammatories, that's probably much better than just painkillers. Or if they think it's a muscle spasm problem, they give you muscle relaxants that will help you. So, so those sort of approach, oh, by the way, I forgot to mention this. Uh, the earlier, earlier uh, neurophysiology that I was talking about is just based on the electrical signal going from the brain, uh, skin to the brain. But we know there's also a chemical component of pain, all the chemical transmitters. So I'm not talking about that because physiotherapy, we don't look at the chemical uh, 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 nature of pain. Doctors look at the chemical nature of pain because their treatment is chemical in nature using drugs. Physical therapy, we look at more the physical nature of pain because our treatment involves physical intervention like heat, electrical energy, and so on. So, so I simplified it tremendously for you, and I apologize for that. I, I'm not saying that what I said earlier on was everything about neurophysiology pain. There's more to that, but that's not the focus of today's lecture. The chronic pain, on the other hand, is a problem because chronic pain is pathological. Chronic pain is a disease, and chronic pain is not like uh, acute pain. Chronic pain here is complex. Sometimes the problem is uh, not it, it, the, 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 the inflammation has gone, the swelling has gone, the, the, the injury has gone, but the pain persists. So it's a bit complex. And there's two causes for this. One is peripheral sensitization, meaning that the threshold the threshold at the periphery has now actually decreased. So if you look at earlier on, at 45 degree temperature and above, it will give you pain. But because of peripheral sensitization, even 40 degrees can give you the perception of pain. So the threshold comes down, so they become very sensitive to pain. That's peripheral sensitization. The second one here occurs, the second one here occurs at the spinal cord level. And that one is got to do with central sensitization. And again, the, the, that means that the signals are no more coming from trans, transduction is already silent. Conduction is also silent. There's no more signal coming there. But transmission continues to go from spinal cord all the way up to the brain. That one is sens central sense, and that's more difficult. And there's, uh, if you read the, the, the literature, they'll explain more and more about how we are now beginning to understand more and more about this uh, compared to before. I'm just looking at my watch. I have 10 minutes, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip some of the slides here. Now, uh, so when we talk about um, uh, inhibition of pain, we can inhibit at the periphery. We can inhibit the dorsal horn, which is a gate control mechanism. We can inhibit the pain at the descending pathway, that U-turn I was telling you about. There's two paths here. From the PAG, they come down here. If you can see my, my pointer here, they go down by this brown route here. I'll just show you. That's that, that brown route 
that's a name. It's Rafa's final track, and then it comes to the uh, uh, dorsal horn and inhibits the signal there. It can also come by the right, uh, the, 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 the one on the left there, the green one. That one is serial spinal tract. Same thing, it comes down. Only difference is the, the, the neurotransmitter is different, but for us, it doesn't make that much difference. It, basically, we can block both of them with the physical energy. We can also inhibit pain by hormonal system, which is actually your endogenous opiates. And this is looking at encephaline, endorphins. I won't, that's the pain matrix area. We'll come to that soon. And then at the cortical level, meaning that you can inhibit pain at the cortical level by uh, uh, reducing stress, reducing anxiety, re reducing fear avoidance. Those are the things that we can, through patient education, to cognitive behavior, behavior therapy and so on. It's not so much uh, uh, physical therapy, but a bit of uh, uh, psycho psychology and a bit of occupational therapy. I think they do that as well. Now, amplification, we'll skip to that. You can, you can amplify, the pain can be amplified as well, but not, not, not for today anyway. So pain assessment, and this is important. So before we talk about treatment, let's talk about assessment. So at transduction level, we can assess the current perception threshold. I'll show you how to do that later. Just remember that word. Then you can also assess the conduction from the periphery to the spinal cord using nerve conduction studies. This one's a bit more complex. You need special equipment. So just keep that in mind, but we don't really do that. You can also measure blood cortisol levels. You can also, you also do pain imaging, functional MRIs. Both of them are not really that accessible. They are also not cheap. Some of them are very expensive. And then finally, we do the VAS, visual analog scale. I think all of you will measure pain by VAS, but that's not enough because if you don't measure the input, the output that gives you will not get, tell you whether you're getting the patient better or not. For example, let me give you this. You measure current perception threshold. And I'm not sure if you can see me because, uh, okay, can you see my, my hands here? Okay. Now, my, let's say this, oh, I, I, you lost my video again. I can't see myself again. I hope you can see me. Let's say your current perception can threshold, can see here, okay. So let's say your current, before treatment, your current perception threshold is here and your VAS was here. After treatment, for example, your current perception threshold actually went up. It became more, the threshold went up. So there is the effect, you're actually blocking the pain at the periphery, but the VS did not change. That's scenario one. So in this case, you know, the treatment had an effect at the periphery, but the patient's perception did not change at all. So something happened between the, the spinal cord and the brain. Perhaps the patient has a lot of anxiety, a lot of fear, a lot of maybe even the pain memory is still there and so on. So regular physio is not going to help, but you're going to have to do something else. The scenario two is this. VAS went down and the current perception threshold went up. This is perfect. This is saying that you get effect at the periphery and you get effect at the perception level. So this is something that you say you are very successful at managing this treatment. The third scenario is this, where the current perception threshold did not change, but perception went down. So you know that you did not change, trans transduction did not change, but perception changed. He actually felt less pain. We can attribute this to maybe placebo effects because you know if there's no change in transduction, then actually your treatment didn't change anything at all. So this could be placebo effect or this patient has a very strong psychosocial component that just having this treatment sort of gave them some, you know, some <laughs> relief, psychological relief, and they didn't feel the pain anymore. But still, you know, this is not, not something that you are satisfied with. And of course, the last scenario is nothing changed. Nothing changed means that's nothing happened, means we confirm that yeah, this treatment is not working. Don't do this treatment again, do something else. Now look at the four scenarios. So if you look at CPT and VAS, you have in that everything that you need to be able to assess, not just the patient's current impairment, but also the effect of your treatment. Now, most of us will only do VAS 
and none of us is doing CPT with VS. I'll show you how to do CPT very quickly, very easily. So I think I have about another five minutes. I'll try, I'll try and uh, get through this. We'll, we'll skip through this. This is just uh, physiological effects. Actually, there's some video on this. If you like, I can give you the, the uh, YouTube video, a lecture that I gave earlier on, which was actually a full hour lecture. So you, the full hour, if you are interested in that, I'll send you the link. So pain is complicated. This is important. Don't think that you can treat pain with just tense. You have to understand all the mechanisms, whether the pain occurs at the periphery, spinal cord, uh, 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 pain matrix level or perception level, and how you can assess that before you start to target, which one is your target, for example. So let's look at acute pain. You want to treat it at the transduction level to increase the sensory threshold of A delta C fibers. You can do that with thermotherapy, cryotherapy. You can also decrease the conduction velocity, and you can do that with cryotherapy. That's the only one you can do. You can also activate the gate control mechanism. You can get that through cryotherapy, at the thermotherapy, laser therapy, and a few other things. The gate control mechanism is somehow very accessible to a, a lot of physical uh, 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 interventions, including uh, manotherapy. Now for chronic pain, we can do all that, but in addition to that, you, you, you so uh, in addition to that, I lost some, I lost something there. Sorry. I apologize for this. Uh, uh, chronic pain. In addition to that, you have to treat at the perception level as well. So you may think about CPT, uh, stress management, patient education, counseling, and so on. That's for chronic pain, not just tense alone. So evidence, Cochrane systematic reviews very quickly. There is evidence for, uh, I, I don't have time to go through, I'll just summarize this to you. For example, you look at acute pain, the evidence tells you that uh, there's tentative evidence that it reduces pain intensity. For mis dysmenorrhea, you find that uh, high frequency tense is effective. For uh, labor, my wife actually did this actually, and maybe Prof uh, Manaf's wife may have done this as well, using tense in labor. Uh, it doesn't work that well, but it can. Uh, and then for, what's this one? For amputation, uh, phantom pain. Oh, phantom pain is interesting. The one here says it's unchanged. I'll tell you why later. Um, for cancer pain, um, it's inconclusive. For OA knee, it's shown to be effective. Then later on, after a few years, they did, cannot confirm it. So it's a bit of gray zone. For chronic pain, inconclusive. And then later they say, no, it didn't work at all. And then the current, the most recent one, uh, nothing has changed. Chronic pain, as I said earlier on, TENS alone will not be successful. So it's not surprising that it's not. For chronic, for low back pain, no evidence to support TENS. Then later version two, some evidence to support. And at the moment, they say, again, no evidence. Low back pain, again, there's a lot of uh, other factors in low back pain. For RA of the hand, possible. For a stroke, uh, <laughs> post stroke patient, I'll, it doesn't work as well, but that's, the cause is not the pain, the cause is a subluxation. So you rather treat the subluxation rather than the pain. So again, sometimes we, you know, we, 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 you, you don't treat the cause. If you just treat the pain, you won't be successful. So if there is a cause that you know, treat the cause. This is something that I showed in all my previous lecture on electrophysical agents. Some of you may have seen this, but, but for pain control, basically we're looking at uh, you know, A delta C fibers and uh, inhibiting pain by periphery, spinal cord, pain matrix, and cerebral cortex. So this is the, the, the main thing, TENS. There are seven modes for TENS. And I want to just slow down a little bit here so that we don't get... The first mode is conventional TENS. And this is the original mode. Melzack and Wall, after they got their theory, they came up with this mode. Too. And it's high frequency. You can see 50 to 100 pulses per second, which is 50 to 100 hertz. Pulse width is long, 50 to 110 microseconds. We're looking at pulse stimulators. Amplitude is sensory, which means a tingling sensation. Treatment is 
as you can see from here, pain mechanism, gate control, Melzer and Wall. Let's look at from there onwards. Fast onset, wonderful. Within five minutes, you get block. Carry over effect, very short, meaning you switch off, the pain comes back. And adaptation is very, very high. That means patient, you have to keep on increasing the frequency, uh, the intensity, sorry, until finally you can't increase anymore. The patient adaptation is too strong. So look at the two things here. Carry over adaptation, they are in red. Those are the things that the disadvantage of conventional mode. So therefore they came up with they came up with a better mode. And that's called low frequency test. Sometimes we call this acupuncture like test, but it's low frequency, one to five hertz. So look, onset of relief now. Very slow, 20 to 40 minutes later, then you get it. But carry over is very, very long. It can last for many hours, but it's uncomfortable. But adaptation is very slight. So what you've done is you, you converted mode one disadvantage into advantage, but you also created advantages from their disadvantage. So not perfect. So mode three. So still looking for the perfect mode, they came up with burst mode. Burst mode is actually just combined mode one and mode two. The carrier frequency is actually mode one, but the treatment frequency is mode two. And when you look at this, you see oh, onset is still slow, but everything else is much better. There's only one disadvantage, that's all. So let's try for another perfect mode. They try mode four, brief intense mode. So brief intense mode, oh, onset now is much faster. Carry over is short, so still not perfect. Mode five, modulated mode, same thing, same as mode four. Mode six, strength duration mode, same thing, no difference. Mode seven, hyper stimulation mode. Everything was okay except patient is uncomfortable. Why? Because you are using pain to treat pain. This is what we call acupuncture like mode. This is electroacupuncture. So using electrical steam to give acupuncture treatment. There's a certain amount of pain, but the pain is what you use to block the pain. Patients normally don't like this. So what you see here is seven modes looking for the perfect mode. Actually, the perfect mode was in front of us all along. All you need is two channels. Channel one, you use conventional mode. Channel two, you use low frequency mode. And when you combine channel one and channel two, you've got the perfect mode because channel one will kick in fast. And when the carryover is gone, channel two kicks in and do the, the, the effect from there onwards and so on. So think of two channel rather than one channel if you are treating tense. And the two channel must be, you must be able to set the modes separately. Some device, you have two channel, but the both channel are in the same settings. You cannot change that. So that's something that you may want to think about. Now I'm going to skip to this and come to the most important part here because I think I've got, oh, I've got one minute left. So which I want to show you here how to measure that CPT. You have it in your, your, your device to measure the CPT. The device is actually uh, this is where you put the electrodes. Uh, the electrode placement here will tell you how electrode placement will then give you the options or which mechanism to target. The options are there. Look, go through the notes. I think they're self-explanatory. This is the one I want to show you. This is a normal TENS device. And you can see from here, unfortunately it's Japanese, but I'll just tell you, it's set at 100 hertz, 500 microseconds. Then after you do that, you then start the, 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 the increasing the, the amplitude. So I'm going to show you this video now. The amplitude is right at the bottom left corner. It's zero milliamp now. So now it's one milliamp, two milliamp. I start to feel a tingling sensation at three milliamp. So at three milliamp, I push down to two, tingling sensation is gone. That's a sensory threshold. Continue, four, five, six, seven, eight. I start to feel a bit of twitching because the motor nerves now start to be depolarized. And you can see now the muscles are now being con at 14 milliamps. I go down to 13, I go down to 12, no more. So that is the motor threshold. Now I continue to do that, 14, 15, 16. Now I feel pain, that's 
pain threshold switch off. So from there, you can see that at 500 microseconds, the first one that I was doing earlier on, when it went to 2 milliamp, that 2 milliamp is a sensory threshold. Then it went all the way to about, I think, 12 milliamp. That's the motor threshold. And then finally, 60 milliamp was the pain threshold. Record that. Every time you do treatment, record this down because it will be different every day because your skin impedance will change. Every day it will be different. So record those three things and record the patient's VAS. But that's not all. For if I want to do mode one, I have to set down between the sensory threshold and the motor threshold. So I must set somewhere between 2 milliamp and 12 milliamp. Let's say for today, I want to do somewhere 50% between the two. So my settings will be 12 minus 2, which is 10, divide by 2, which is 5. So 2 plus 5 means my setting today is 7 milliamps. That 7 milliamps is 50% of the between sensory and motor threshold. Now, if it works for the patient, I'll keep to that. If it doesn't work, then I will increase it next session, maybe to 100%, so 12 milliamps. And if it still doesn't work, then maybe I will change the mode. I will change to maybe mode two because mode two is going into the, into the motor threshold. And if that still doesn't work, then I may change into the pain threshold. So I will start to do mode seven to do this. And if mode seven still doesn't work, then obviously I will give up on tense. But that's how you move from the different modes to see whether or not they have any effect by measuring sensory threshold, motor threshold, pain threshold, and VAS. And then look at the four scenarios that we talk about and see your patient before and after treatment, which scenario do they fall under? And then you will be able to know whether it's effective or not effective. Now for pain threshold, this is interesting. At 16 milliamp, you know that's the pain threshold. So if I wanted to go above pain threshold, you can go, let's say we go 20% above. 20% means plus three. So I will set at 19 milliamps. That's because there's no top level. There's no maximum pain threshold. You don't have that. Okay, so that's, gonna, I'm going to stop here now. I really, really apologize for running through all this with you. This is actually a student doing the, 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 the steps there that you saw there. And um, oh, I've got two minutes. I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay, anyway, I, I'll leave it to your, uh, uh, your host to decide how we're going to spend that two minutes, if there are any questions on this. I'll stop this now. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Goh, for that very interesting and informative session. I'm pretty sure that everyone today, who are mostly physiotherapists, will have a fruitful session and gain a lot of information from Dr. Goh's uh, lecture for today. And um, I think um, for him, we are not doing justice because I think for this topic, actually, we need one webinar session specifically for uh, Professor Goh. Because it is a very interesting topic, but require I think require a lot of time to 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 explain to all the participants. But again, because we are racing against time, so we, we cannot afford to do that. So now we move on to our next session, which is a question and answer session. Here I have two questions from our participant. Question number one, coming from Nuri Nabila. Hi, Prof. Is there any correlation or effect on peripheral or central sensitization if patient is in prolonged exposure to heat or electrical stimulation therapy? Thank you. Uh, the chronic pain thing, isn't it? Yeah, I would say that um, there is a small correlation. You saw the evidence that I gave you. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. So I'm thinking that if you're looking at yeah. peripheral and sensory sensitization, it's a multimodal treatment. Don't just do TENS alone, do patient education, cognitive behavior therapy, uh, fear avoidance, all those things, are memory of pain, manual therapy, all those things probably will be more successful uh, uh, rather than just one uh, TENS approach. That's the short answer. Okay. All right. Um, I hope that answer um, suffice for Nuri Nabila. Now I move on to the next question from Ida Hasni. As physiotherapy deal with a lot of chronic pain in musculoskeletal, according to your experience, is there any specific treatment approach that can be used together with TENS to help reducing pain perception in patients with musculoskeletal related chronic pain condition? This is a long question. Can you? 
Can you understand the question, Prof? This is still looking at chronic pain to some extent, isn't it? And I think I answered it partially in the sense that, yeah, there are lots of things that you can do in conjunction with TENS, like uh, cognitive behavior therapy, fear avoidance, patient education, manual therapy, uh, thermal therapy, and so on. So, yes, but it's complicated because, again, chronic pain, uh, you know, the cause of the chronic pain is um, complex. Uh, Acute pain is so simple, you know, it's inflammation or swelling or something else, mechanical or something, but chronic pain, not that easy. So I think that's why a lot of people have pain clinics that that that, that treat chronic pain, not acute pain, but chronic pain, because you need a multidisciplinary team to do that. And that may be the best approach, I think, for chronic pain. All right. Okay, very uh, good answer from Professor Goh. I hope that that suffice for our second question. And the third question, it seems like we have uh, multiple questions for Professor Go from Malati Anak Perempuan Kalisinggam, Puan Malati. So, Prof, would interferential therapy differ to TENS when managing chronic pain and how does this affect the perception of pain? Okay, this is really a good question. I could go on for like 30 minutes answering this, but I'll give you the short answer. Okay. I know that some of you have been, have been, taught to believe that interferential is really, really, you know, wonderful device for pain management. To be honest with you, any electrical device is sufficient to treat pain. Not, none of them are special. The only thing about interferential long ago in the 70s and 80s is because of skin impedance. Because when we, the, before the 80s, some of you were not even born at that time, the devices that we have, the minute you switch on the electrical device, they start to feel pain. So you, cut, you know that the, the three points that I told you at, they were all so close that essentially they were all at the same point. Sensory, motor, and pain threshold were all at the same point. Now, interferential sort of gave us the ability to get past this and go down so that you can actually spread it out a bit more. But, but in the 90s, along came pulse current stimulators. And those pulse current stimulators are so good that there's no problem with skin impedance. You switch it on, they don't feel pain. In fact, sometimes you can go full blast and they still don't have any, they don't feel any pain. It's very comfortable. So interferential to me has already outlived its usefulness because pulse current stimulators are much better, much cheaper, and more versatile than interferential. But you know, old habits die hard. We have a lot of interferential around and then patients like it because, you know, that, that, that suction cups thing. So they think it's a bit like uh, traditional Chinese medicine, you know, they think it's a bit like massage and, and moxie buxton and so on. So it's nothing to do with electrotherapy. They're just impressed by the suctioning cups and the massage effects and they like it. But the physiological response is not different. Electrical currents, whatever you use, is still electrical current. And my advice is the best one is pulse current stimulators, the portable tents that I just showed you, which is very cheap, very affordable. It can even be used for home use. That's a long answer, sorry. I said you okay, short yeah, answer. Prof. Uh, and maybe we can um, we can take two more questions before we end our session. The first one, uh, the, the third one, sorry, the fourth one will be, do you agree? From Dr. Fatim, do you agree pain is to some extent a psychological problem and pain management should incorporate manage management for this psychological issue as well? Yes, for yeah. chronic pain, the answer is definite yes. For acute pain, the answer is no. Acute pain is more physiological response. So it's inflammation, swelling, uh, damage to tissues. And those are the things, healing process, those are acute pain. Chronic pain, you are very, very right. It is psychological. Uh, not all psychological, it's partly psychological. So yes, talk to the psychologist, team approach. All right. Okay, and last question from Shelling Behzin. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. When we provide exercise, sometimes pain is reduced. How does it work through the pattern of pain? How will you explain to your client or your patients? Okay, so if you're doing, I'm, I'm not sure you're talking about McKenzie or whether you're talking about Williams or not, I'm not sure. But, but we know that movement, movement rather than immobilization. If you immobilize somebody and don't move, we know that that makes it worse. 
the, not just the pain, but it makes a lot of other things worse. So we stop immobile. Last time, you know, back pain straight away, go to bed, don't move at all, stay in bed and don't, don't uh, stay in bed for one week, two weeks, and then finally you get out of bed. That's a really, really bad uh, approach. Immobilization doesn't work. So what does work? Movement, movement. Now, you don't have to have specific exercises. Normally, if they just move within the activities of daily living, that means they just, they, they, they do normal, don't play sports, of course, but they do normal activities of daily living. They go to the office, they sit, they stand, they walk, they, they change position. And sometimes they do that with some protection, with a corset on and so on, that helps. So that is something that movement helps to reduce pain. Maybe it's the mechanoreceptors in there. Perhaps, I'm not sure. Maybe it's a similar to, you know, mobilization because you are doing self-mobilization when you move. So exercise may come under that category. There's only one thing that I want to uh, emphasize here is that if you are talking about core exercises like, you know, um, uh, multifidus and so on, th those are looking at muscle imbalance, muscle imbalance occurring that will give you uh, uh, not the cause of the pain, but prolong the symptom of pain. Maybe it works to restoring the muscle balance and therefore uh, preventing stress on the neural tissue. So maybe it works that way. But those type of patients, in my so in my experience treating a lot of patients, those type of those type of patients are very, very rare. Very rare. Hardly maybe I may see in one month, maybe one or two. No more than that. So don't go treating everybody with core stabilization because not all of them will respond to that. Um, but anyway, um, some other people may give you a different, some people believe in it. So they just do nothing but uh, exercise and core stabilization. But uh, I'm, I'm a bit more skeptical. Sorry. Sorry about that. Okay. So 